Hi everyone, Jim here from drtangenstein.com. We've got an experimental episode today uh, where I thought I'd put to bed or prove correct some of the myths and folklore around chilling your wort. So, enjoy. So I've just finished brewing a lovely red ale inspired by my favorite Welsh brewery. You know you are. And now in search of clarity, I'm gonna cool my beer in three different ways. I'm gonna do it in these small samples so you guys can really see the, the full effects. So the first, I'm gonna pour out and just leave to the elements. So this will cool fairly slowly. And this is something I've done numerous times in the past, you know, finish the boil, your Irish moss is in, throw it straight into the fermenter hot, leave it overnight and pitch your yeast in the morning. The second, which is the classic homebrew one gallon batch technique, I'm gonna cool this one on an ice bath. So fairly quickly, a little bit quicker than the previous. The final sample, I'm gonna cool really quickly and I'll show you how in a second. Now, the reason for doing this is that I've sort of been reading the literature around coagulation of proteins and polyphenols and it seems that potentially the stuff you leave behind in the in the kettle isn't all the true that you have. See, in the kettle your wort is really hot so things are super soluble in there. As you cool down in your fermenter, in, in your ice bath perhaps, things become less soluble and start to crash out and become solid and that makes true at the bottom of your fermenter, which, you know, if you're looking for, the, for a clear beer, that's pretty much the enemy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see if A, cooling time, and B, cooling temperature make a difference. Let's go. Okay, just 300 mils of each in each beaker. Now this is straight out of the kettle with hashtag no filter on the kettle. So you should really have all the true you need in there. So this one is easy. I'm just gonna leave it to one side. It'll do its worst. This one, again, it's fairly easy. I'm just gonna dunk it and leave it. Now this is a bath with ice and water. If you've ever left if you've ever left a beer in just an ice bath in the hope that it gets cold, you'll know that that's not really the best way to do it. You need to add water in there so that your, your, the surface of your vessel has the most, what you call, uh, thermal contact with the ice. So essentially the water gets cold, the water cools your glass much more quickly than, the, than cool air would. So you need water in there. If you are cooling like this at home, uh, you know, maybe you brew, brewed a small batch, you cool it in the kitchen sink. A quick tip is if you put salt in the water, if you saturate the water with salt, you can go from water being zero degrees to around about minus 12, minus 15. So, you know, that's a pretty big boost there. We're not doing that today because we wanna see the difference between slow cooling and fast cooling. Now, for the fast cool, I've got my hands on something quite cool. I got myself some dry ice. Now, if you're thinking of cooling your beer with dry ice, I've got kind of four recommendations for you. Number one, probably don't bother because it's probably not essential. Number two, wear these stupid fat finger gloves. As you see, I'm wearing an off-brand t-shirt today with long sleeves. I've got my mime costume on and I'm wearing shoes. Essentially, you gotta minimize the places that this stuff can touch you. Cryogenics are, they're, they're kind of dangerous, you know? I mean, you can kind of touch it and handle it, but if you touch it for too long, like if, if a piece gets lost in your, in your belt or whatever, you can end up with really bad ice burns on you. Okay, number three, do it in a 
big space. This spa this place looks small, but behind the cameras out there, I'm sure where you're watching, the space is actually quite big. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide, and it goes straight from solid to gas when it heats up. So as you put this stuff in, you're gonna see carbon dioxide given off. Now that carbon dioxide isn't dangerous, but it is dangerous if it pushes all the oxygen out of the room. So be careful. The final thing is if you're gonna use dry ice, add it slowly because you don't want your beer bubbling up and you don't want it, uh, you don't want all the carbon dioxide released at once. So let's cool this mother. Finally at room temp. So I'll just recap you on uh, on what's been going on. So I drew three samples of beer from my five gallon red ale batch. This one, sample one, has been just left to its own devices, left to cool naturally. Batch two or sample two was cooled in ice water, no salt, so just, just ice water it's in a nice bath. Uh, it's just been allowed to raise to room temperature now to make the whole thing fair. Sample three was cooled using dry ice. So just to recap, this one's been spending over an hour to get to about 20 degrees. This one got to 18 degrees in 30 minutes. This one got to an amazing eight degrees in four minutes. Now, four, four, four minutes sounds like quite a long time because you can get uh, immersion chillers now, like the Hydra and things like that, that cool like a five gallon batch down in six minutes. But it's eight degrees, right? C cooling is sort of an exponential. You can cool something very quickly at the start and then it starts to tail off. Eight degrees in four minutes is incredible. Right, but we weren't investigating how quickly I could cool beer. We were investigating, does it make a difference? So, Looking at them, initially you can sort of see, well, this one looks like a jar of gravy. These two kind of look like a red ale with stuff in the bottom. And that's kind of what I thought would happen. What I thought would happen was this one would look like gravy with clumps in. This one would have a lot of troube and this one would have a lot more, a bit more troube. What's actually happened is there's a big difference between cooling and not cooling, but the rate of cooling doesn't seem to make a difference. Now, I, I know that it's quite hard for you guys to see that on the camera, so I'm just gonna shine a light through it so that you can see. So, like I say, gravy, kinda clear, and there you go. Now, maybe I'm biased, maybe I'm not, Personally, I think this one is a little bit clearer than this one. So eight degrees versus 18 degrees is clearer, but does it matter? Probably not. Look at the amount of troops, roughly the same. The colors the same. The, the, the big difference I think here between the two, and I thought this might happen, is the particle size. So as we've crash cooled, I don't know if you can see here, but basically the, the, the stuff at the bottom of this is just a powder. It's a it's a very fine powder that is going to be very easy to be sucked into your, into any uh, siphon tube that you have on there. This stuff, on the other hand, is more defined. There's a there's a more of a, a macro structure to this. There's kind of threads in it. Uh, you can you can see the pieces almost if if you get what I mean. Um, and that that's I think mainly due to the rate of cooling rather than how cool you get it. So if you cool something really fast, you get what's called nucleation in multiple points. So essentially you get particle formation all over the place. So you end up with smaller particles. If you cool something more slowly, you get that in very concentrated areas. So you get one particle forming, which grows, and then another particle form over here, and that grows. And that's what I think you've got. Now, admittedly, this doesn't 
I, I understand that this doesn't seem like a really good conclusion to an experiment. Personally, I, I, I think it's cool. You know, this is, this is absolutely 100% convinced me that I am no longer going to put gravy in my fermenter. I'm going to at least chill it a little bit first. If you don't mind putting that in there, then go ahead and do it. I know the guys over at Brewlosophy, at brewlosophy.com, uh, they did an experiment where they actually added kettle trube and they got a better fermentation off that. So it, it's entirely up to you. Personally, I was looking for clarity. So, and I think I've achieved it. This isn't over. I'm going to try to quantify this. I'm going to take it to the lab. So look out for updates on the blog. But for now, don't use dry ice, but do cool. After this was filmed, I took the samples over to the lab and had a bit of a further look at them. And I've written all the results of that up in a blog post, which is available now over at drtankenstein.com. Now, if you're not familiar with what a blog is, it's, it's a bit like YouTube, but there's just not quite as many cat videos. Now, in the meantime of filming this and putting this out, the Brewlosophy podcast did an episode on the no chill method. So I recommend checking that out for a bit of further reading on this. It's not quite the same, but it's, it's a lot of, sub, lot of um, subjects overlap there. So that's it. As always, subscribe to the YouTube channel, visit drtankenstein.com for the blog, and follow me on Twitter, at Dr. Tankenstein. Thanks.